Hey, Smoky Hill Vineyard. It's good to see you, Jay Pathak, here again, all the way up in Arvada, Colorado. And uh, just so honored again to be with you. We started a new series last week, and we're going to continue this week. But again, I just want to say how grateful I am for the Smoky Hill Vineyard and the relationship we've had together um, with our churches, the Mile High Vineyard and Smoky Hill Vineyard, and really more personally, um, the life that I've gotten to live with uh, Greg and June Thompson. And uh, Danielle and I are just so grateful for uh, their relationship, their ministry in our life. And uh, it's just really exciting to get the opportunity to do this together in this crazy time of COVID. And last week we started this series in Daniel where we're considering how do we how do we stay strong in the midst of uh, such turbulent times? So much is changing. There's so much intensity and chaos in the world. And uh, last week, we looked a bit at how uh, Daniel, in the midst of what is pretty turbulent times, when God's people don't have hardly any power at all, Daniel chooses to stand up in little ways before in big ways, um, really demonstrating that his faith in God is what's most important to him. And God honors that and gives him favor and a way to be connected to and in relationship to changing the world when um, really it started in some very simple ways about his diet, actually, is what we looked at last week. So last week, really challenged you to consider, how do I make some small choices? How do I make small decisions? What are some things I need to stop doing? What are some things I need to start doing? How do I need to choose to honor God in some small ways so that when there's big moments, big moments of testing and moments where I need to stand up for my faith, maybe in massive ways, massive places of injustice, I'll be prepared to do that because I've been faithful in little things. Well, this week, as we turn the corner into Daniel chapter two, um, we're going to encounter some realities that we're experiencing right now in our culture. So I think it's a really relevant passage for us to consider where um, we're right now, you and I are living because we're in the midst of an election cycle in a moment where worldviews are colliding and clashing, where people are trying to decide how is justice and care brought into the world and specifically in our country? What does it mean for the right thing to be done? For example, on behalf of the poor. What's the role of power and authority in government in something like health care or taxes? And how can government get stuff done when in relationship to the economy? Should we go more in debt? Should we just print more money, create more inflation? I don't know, we've been doing a decent amount of that. And how do we think about our nation, about weaker people being oppressed by stronger people? How do we make sense of that? And what is the role of government? And then how are we supposed to vote accordingly? And there's, right now in our nation, we're keenly aware, and I believe it's God's grace to us, we're keenly aware of racial injustice. And of course, these things are just crowding into so much of the public debate and discourse. And as believers, we get swept into those debates. How is it that justice is brought into the world? And how is it that things are made right? Because we know things aren't right. Things are wrong. Well, in this chapter in Daniel, Daniel's going to engage some of these realities with uh, the kingdom that he's a captive in. And so uh, we're going to be working with the Bible Project. So take a look here at the Bible Project video. It's going to explain a little bit about um, what, where we're at as we come through and into chapter 2. So let's watch that together. After this begins the Aramaic section, which you'll see has this really cool symmetrical design. So first, the king of Babylon has a dream that, it turns out, only Daniel is able to interpret. It's about a huge statue made of four types of metal, and it symbolizes a sequence of kingdoms, and the head is Babylon. 
But then a huge rock comes flying in, and it shatters the statue, and it becomes this huge mountain. Now, this dream is the first of many symbolic visions in the book, and this one introduces the basic storyline of them all. Daniel says that the statue represents a train of human kingdoms following from Babylon, and they will all fill God's world with violence. But one day, God's kingdom will come and will confront and humble the arrogant kingdoms of this world and fill the world with the healing justice of God's reign and rule. Man, I love the Bible Project. I hope I hope you enjoyed that. And hopefully you've grabbed that Read Scripture app because it'll enable you to follow along in our study of Daniel. And it'll hopefully get into your heart, into your mind as you keep working through this book. But here in this chapter, uh, the king has a dream and nobody can interpret it. And as we learn in chapter one, God has given Daniel um, favor to interpret dreams. And so uh, God gives him favor to do this. And Daniel exclaims how he knows that this is because of God. A scan all the way down to verse 19. Let me, let me read. It says, During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He de- deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Okay, so then, as we just saw in the video, he goes in, he tells the king what it means, that there's all these kingdoms that will be rising up and put down and risen up and put down, and your kingdom is no different than those kingdoms what Daniel says. But there will be a day that God will establish his kingdom and justice will reign forever and ever. And this is how Daniel summarizes this in verse 44. Daniel says this, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Wow. Now remember, the only thing that puts Daniel in this moment is the fact he was faithful in small things, the chapter before, and then God somehow gives him favor, and he ends up in this moment. He has this incredible interpretation. But this authority, this power as Daniel says earlier, is from God. So it isn't like he's a super smart guy. It's God's given him this favor. And what Daniel describes to the king, I think the only thing that can make him bold enough to say this, so honestly, is the fact they've been bold earlier. But what he describes to the king is very simple. It runs through the scriptures front to back, side to side, and that is simply this, that in the end, God will get his way. And all things will be made new again, that God will be king, and he will reign and he will rule. And the description of the Bible is that the world is not as it should be, that something's gone horribly wrong, and sin and injustice and brokenness and pain rule in the world, and that it's God's intention to set things to right, that he will ultimately someday. But not just someday. You see, as the Bible continues, this picture of that kingdom that will endure forever someday is breaking backward into this day. Not fully, but the presence and the power of the kingdom come upon people. And they begin to move around and bring the very power of heaven, of the future, when things will be made new, into this present day. See, this is what we think is happening with Jesus. The king comes and walks among his rebel people. Jesus in Luke chapter 4 begins to describe what it looks like when the kingdom comes. And to do this, he quotes from Isaiah, another prophetic moment, not just Daniel, but now in Isaiah, a prophet. Isaiah 600 years before Jesus is walking around, describes what it will look like 
when the kingdom of God invades the kingdoms of this dark, broken world. And this is how Jesus describes it. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. This is Jesus speaking. He says, When he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went in the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And rolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus chooses a part of Isaiah that they would have known was talking about the same thing Daniel was talking about, someday when God's kingdom would reign and rule supreme. So he reads it. But then listen to what Jesus says. Verse 20, Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue was, were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus says, you know this stuff Daniel talked about? You know this stuff Jeremiah talked about? All these prophets of old, and Isaiah, I'm the one bringing that kingdom now. Now, you'd think that people would be pretty pumped about this, right? But they're not. Actually, if you know the rest of this passage, it says they try to kill him. They try to push him off a cliff because they're so ticked off. It's so like, who does this guy think he is? But Jesus goes around demonstrating that he is who he says he is. He begins to heal the sick and raise the dead. He's opening the eyes of the blind, and he's moving towards the poor, and he's crossing racial boundaries and setting things to right that nobody ever imagined possible to where after a certain amount of time, people go, maybe this is who they said. Maybe this is the one that the prophets spoke of. The problem is, they had pressed it further. They thought that that meant he would be the kind of king that would kick out Rome, that would destroy all the kingdoms, that he would fulfill everything that the Old Testament prophets had said, like Daniel. Actually, there's some interesting places where Jesus refers to Daniel. Um, we'll talk more about that later in the series. And what Jesus is doing is showing them what that kingdom will be like. See, some people say Jesus healed the sick because it was kind of a magic trick. Like he did a magic trick and then they had to listen to him teach. I think that's a theory preachers would come up with that they thought the most important thing Jesus did was talk. If Jesus wanted to do a magic trick, he would just flown up in the sky and shot fireballs out of his hands and his eyes. That's not what he was doing. What he was doing, he was just gaining a crowd. He'd do, he'd do loop-de-loops in the sky. He can do whatever he wants. That's not what he was doing. What he was doing was showing them the kingdom to confirm that he was who he says he is, that he was the confirmation of this Old Testament prophecy. See, Jesus knew. Jesus knew that the kind of justice that you and I want, the kind of power that you and I need, the kind of power that will rescue the poor, that will set people free from their sins and their addictions and their fear and their pain and their shame can only come with Jesus as king. See, so many of us are trying to get the kingdom without the king. We want racial inequity to be dealt with. We want the poor to be lifted up. We want uh, government powers to operate in a place where they don't have corruption. They actually honor and respect and care for the position of authority they've been given. And we're constantly let down and we're constantly, people fall short. And it's because we don't get the kingdom without the king. Now, that isn't to say we don't get any of the kingdom. Listen, man, God has used people, incredible people, to bring his kingdom, even in governmental systems, uh, to bring transformation for the poor, to bring health care, to bring um, economic flourishing, to break down racial injustice. But here's the truth. It's a disproportionate amount of people that the reason they're doing it is because they love and follow Jesus. Church, brothers and sisters, don't seek the kingdom without the king. We're followers of Jesus. We need Jesus at the center. 
Don't seek forms of justice that you can get without knowing, loving, and following Jesus. You know, someone that knew this really well was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. See, we hail him as an incredible civil rights activist, but sometimes what we forget is he's a pastor. And, you know, even his great Eye of a Dream speech is drawing heavily from the Old Testament prophets, describing the justice of God being brought to bear. And MLK, many people don't know this, but MLK had 10 commandments that he wanted all of the civil rights activism to um, operate under. These 10 commandments you had to agree to and sign in order to march with MLK. Okay, so listen to the 10 commandments. I'm going to read them very quickly to you. Number one, these are MLK's 10 commandments. Number one, meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus. Number two, remember always that the nonviolent movement seeks justice and reconciliation, not victory. Number three, walk and talk in the manner of love, for God is love. Number four, pray daily to be used by God in order that all men might be free. Number five, sacrifice personal wishes in order that all men might be free. Number six, observe with both friend and foe the ordinary rules of courtesy. Be gracious, be kind, because we follow Jesus we want our message to come with that kindness. Number seven, seek to perform regular service for others and for the world. Number eight, refrain from the violence of fist, tongue, or heart. Number nine, strive to be in good spiritual and bodily health. Number 10, follow the directions of the movement and of the captain on a demonstration. Be a submitted person. You don't just do your own thing. Martin Luther King Jr. knew that the power that was needed to fight racial injustice and inequity, to overcome 400 years of slavery and Jim Crow laws and discrimination would be found with and through King Jesus. Brothers and sisters, as we're entering into political discourse, as we're engaging in issues of injustice in the world, let us seek the King. Let us know the King. Let us be people that are guided by the fruit of the Spirit. That we don't allow our own frustrations or our fears to make it so that we lack courage. Daniel gives a prophecy to this king. It says, justice has come and is coming from God through God, and he will prevail. And we'll see as the chapters continue that Daniel is going to keep calling the king to humility in relationship to that vision to begin to bring that justice to bear now. Let us be people that seek the king, pray for our nation, and are settled in a love relationship with King Jesus. Let's be careful of putting our hope and our trust in any kingdom other than God's kingdom. May God bless you and keep you. Let me pray for us as we consider these scriptures and we move into this week. Let me pray for us. So, Lord, I pray for each one of us. Lord, would you help to draw us to repentance if we're just reacting or responding in ways that we're seeking the hope and the life and the justice of the kingdom without you, King Jesus. Lord, we don't want to live in a world where you're not king of our lives. And so, Lord, we thank you how you've come for us and you've come to set us free, to give us hope in the midst of an exile, just like Daniel. And Lord, give us strength to be the kinds of people that live with hope because we know that you are ultimate reality and you offer ultimate healing and justice and freedom. Fill us with hope and let us be brokers of that hope. And teach us how to be deeply connected and committed to you, I pray. Pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you move into this week. May God give you hope for he is coming, has come, and will make all things new again.